Hey art nerds, today I'm going to show you how to use the new Albrecht Durer watercolor markers on Strathmore's beautiful tone blue mixed media paper to create a vibrant pumpkin. So to begin with, you're going to want to start with a printout on your tone blue paper. And I have a few tutorials here on this channel that will walk you through that process. You can also just sketch it in with a pencil or sketch it and then ink it with pit pens. It really just depends on what you feel like doing. I went with the printout because it saved me a little bit of time and when I was making this I was on a massive time crunch. So I'm also using the beautiful pigmented polychromos color pencils and I'm going to bring in a few additional mixed media materials as this progresses. But this tutorial is very heavily focused on Strathmore products and Faber-Castell products. And on that note I want to thank Faber-Castell for providing these wonderful markers for me to use in this video. This video was not sponsored. I was not paid to create this video, but they did send the markers for me to use. And I want to thank Strathmore for the same thing, for providing the beautiful mixed media paper for me to use in this tutorial. When supply companies send these sort of things to me, it saves me a lot of money and it makes it a lot easier for me to be able to record these videos. So I really appreciate them working with me. So we're going to begin with our Faber-Castell Albrecht Durer watercolor markers and I have a video where I talk about these in depth and I'm filling in my pumpkin with the lightest yellow in the 10 piece set and I'm really not concerned about it looking scribbly about it looking streaky because my intention is to apply water on top to activate those pigments get them to move around and to better disperse and I am using um, Faber-Castell Albrecht Durer number 109 for this so it's kind of a very warm yellow and I'm applying copious amounts of water to it. So what that does is it reactivates the pigments and after talking to the Faber-Castell rep I found out that the pigments are not what one normally thinks of when we think of watercolor pigments. It's not like PB29. These are India ink water soluble India ink watercolor markers which are very different from using watercolor pigment markers. They're going to have different working properties but it's not like it's a completely different thing from a completely different planet. The biggest difference is India ink tends to be extremely light fast so we're not necessarily going to have some of the fading problems and you guys can see I'm coloring in my segments of the pumpkin in sections wetting it down with water and then moving on to another segment and I'm doing this because I want to activate the India ink as fast as possible for the best blending the best reactivation possible and I just love how the Strathmore tone blue mixed media paper can take watercolors like this without a problem. It really is a wonderful mixed media paper. I've been so impressed with the Strathmore tone blue and tone tan mixed media papers. They're really heavy duty papers. So now I'm applying 179 which is I believe their dark sepia as a base for the stem. Now something really cool about Faber-Castell products is they are truly designed to be mixed media, particularly when we're talking about their artist grade materials. So pit pins, polychromos, the Albrecht Durer line, the artist grade materials. And you can tell that they're designed to be mixed media because they all have a color number in addition to a color name. So in this tutorial I'm mostly going to be referring to the color number. And what's really cool about that is a 109 in the Albrecht Durer watercolor marker is going to match the 109 in the watercolor pencils, in the polychromos, and in the pit pens. So once my 175 has dried, I'm directly applying 170, which I believe is May green. So it's a very light spring green to the stem. Because if you guys have looked at pumpkin stems, they're a little brown, they're a little bit green, and I wanted to capture both. And something else that's great about this mixed media paper is when we're using water-based markers, right, we often have problems with the marker tip destroying the paper, right? It starts to tear it up, it starts to pill it. Well, the combination of the sturdy Strathmore mixed media paper and the soft 
but not too soft. It's a fiber brush nib, but it's one of the best fiber brush nibs I've ever seen. I haven't had any problems with fraying or splitting, and you guys know I would complain about that if it was a problem. But it's very gentle on the paper, and it doesn't tear it up. So direct application is not really a concern with these. Normally, you guys see me push to uh, indirect application where we would apply it to like a craft mat or ceramic plate and then pick it up with our brush and apply it. And that is still a really useful technique, but you can use direct application with these markers. So now that our first layer on the pumpkin has dried, I'm applying another layer of 109. I'm going to start developing some of the shading and some of the shadows. We're going to start building up the color depth. And my goal for this pumpkin is to utilize the watercolor markers to fill large area of, wow, large areas of color. I don't know why everything is a tongue twister for me today. Large areas of color. And then once it's dried, I'm going to go in with the polychromos pencils and use it to make my colors really pop. So I don't know if you guys know this. I am not Lacry Fine Art. I am not a color pencil gal. I do not have the patience. I really admire people who have the patience, but y'all, that ain't me. So I love using color pencils in mixed media applications because it allows me to invest a little work and get a lot of impact. So that's why I'm using the watercolor markers to kind of lay down our areas of color. And then I'm gonna go over it again with the color pencils for that pop of opacity. When you're making art and you're making art on a deadline or you don't have a lot of time to make art, and I know a lot of y'all have school and a lot of y'all work, you have to be a little tricksy with how you apply your art supplies so that you can get the most out of it, spending the least amount of money and spending the least amount of time. Because y'all, time is a resource and wasting time is just like wasting money. And that's why I do these art supply reviews to help you guys save both time and money and find supplies that you guys will enjoy. And y'all, I wanna point out, I am really saturating this paper. I'm treating this like I would any other watercolor paper, be it a cellulose paper or a cotton rag paper. And since this is a mixed media paper, sometimes mixed media papers don't really take watercolor super well, but I've been playing around with the Strathmore Tone mixed media papers for a while. And I have to say that for the kind of work I do, which is more comic based, more illustration based, not necessarily fine art watercolor. So take what I say with a grain of salt, but I'm really happy with the performance and I can't wait to play with these more. All right, so now I'm going to use a little bit of their Thalo Blue, their cooler blue color, which is 110. And I'm going to use that to kind of paint in a background. And this is a tip that I love using. I learned it while I was at SCAD. Paul Hudson taught us this in our concept art class. And this is a great way to make just a single illustration, a single image, a single object, a single person look like it's more of a fully fleshed out, fully thought out illustration just by creating, it's not even like a real background. It's just some shading on the page that makes it look like there's more of a background and it makes the lighting seem stronger. So since we are playing around with color and opacity and lighting on this tone blue paper, establishing a good light source is really important and doing that by creating a background by pushing the blue of the paper into the background is going to make the pumpkin pop even more so that's what i'm doing here and what i'm doing is i'm actually applying my darker blue where the light would be coming from so like behind the pumpkin but like okay imagine that our light source right is on the front of the pumpkin um, I'm putting more of this phthalo blue in the background and underneath, just kind of making it feel like it actually exists, like it's an actual object on the paper. And you guys have seen me do this technique in so many of my tutorials. It's a favorite technique of mine. It might even 
be considered a bit of a crutch, but it works really well. It's a very simple technique to, to show, to demonstrate, and it has such a good result. There isn't really a good reason for me not to show it and not to use it and not to brag about it to you guys, especially since I do watercolor comics and I'm drawing backgrounds all the ding dang time. So like when I'm doing stuff for you guys that isn't like comic or fully fledged illustration based, I do not feel bad about fudging the illustration, fudging the background just a little bit. Um, because like we talked about earlier, time is a resource. Okay, so once that had a chance to dry, I'm going back in with our 175. And something I want to point out, and I'm going to talk about this more in kind of the unbox and swatch slash overview video, is that with these, so these are double tipped, double ended watercolor markers. We have our brush tip, we also have a bullet tip. If you swatch them, and I'll show you guys the swatches. The brush tip seems to be darker than the bullet tip in a lot of, with the older bodies and then with the newer bodies because um, I switched out this 10 piece set for a 20 piece set at Hands On Creativity, the reverse seems to be true. So I know from having used the Winsor & Newton pigment watercolor markers, which are apparently being discontinued, I know from using those that flow issues, pigment flow issues are a real problem. Um, just for any product that utilizes two sides and needs pigments to make the thing go. So um, to me, while this isn't, this isn't a deal killer for me, I would tell y'all if it was a deal killer, but it's something to be aware of. You basically get two colors out of the market, out of the marker. And I think this is something that Faber-Castell should either work to solve. And I have some ideas for how they could solve that, mostly involving pump action to force pigments to the tip you want them at. Or they could just roll with it and call it a twin tip and advertise that you're really getting two colors, two tones in one. So it's really um, just about disclosing that fact to the customer so that people know that when they get them. Because believe it or not, some people don't swatch their art supplies before they jump in. I think it's bonkers, but some people don't. All right, so now I'm going in with a little bit of 113, still developing that color, still building it up. You can see already, because we're using contrasting colors, right? We have the tone blue paper, and then we're using oranges to paint our bright pumpkin. So you've got that contrast going on, and it really seems to start to pop, start popping off the paper, right? just like I pop up on this channel. Um, anyway, by using contrasting papers, that's one of the things that makes these tone papers a lot of fun, is you can either do complementary colors and softly build up something delicate, or you can select contrasting colors and really build up a lot of color, a lot of contrast, and a lot of vibrancy. So you have options, and they're really fun to play with. Plus, you're not fighting the white of a white piece of paper. You're starting with a base color and you're using that to inspire and influence your work. And that's one of the reasons I really love these tone papers. And if you guys watch my watercolor videos, you know I usually tone the illustration first before I start painting. Even watercolor comic pages get toned. And that's so that I'm not fighting the white of the paper. When I'm building up colors, I'm using a base color and going from there. And when you start with a tone paper like this, it really can influence your art. It can really influence the colors that you're using and it can set the atmosphere. So I'm going back in with our 110, our phthalo blue, to develop some more blue on the left side, or sorry, our right side, the left side of the pumpkin. And something else that I really like about these watercolor markers is they're very buildable, they're very layer layerable, and that's something that when we're working with dye-based watercolors, even my 
favorite dye base watercolors, the Echo Lime brush pens, you can't really build up color the way you would if you were dealing with pigments because with dyes, they always reactivate. And then as I mentioned earlier in the video, dye base color tends to be extremely light fugitive. So yeah, you get some beautiful neons, you get some great fluorescence, you get some really nice light bright colors. But the cool thing about India ink is you can get those bright colors. You can get that saturation, but you don't have to worry about light fastness as much as you would with dye-based watercolors. And now you guys see I'm doing some indirect application. I've applied it to my non-porous craft mat. And don't worry, I'm going to link all the materials used down in the description below. And by the way, if you use the links in my description, you're helping to support this channel. They are Amazon affiliate links. You pay no additional money. Money, but I see a small bounty. So this is a great way to support what I'm doing on this channel without spending additional money. So please consider shopping from my affiliate links before you go elsewhere. And usually if I know there's a better price someone else, I will go with the best price, even if I don't see any money from it. And that's because I'm always looking out for you guys. I want you guys to have access to the best prices. But since I don't have any, any of those kind of affiliate deals worked out with like Jerry's or Plaza or Dick Blick, I will use affiliate links to help fund this channel. So you guys will be able to find links in the description below to everything that I used. So now I wanted to kind of break this up because it's looking a little bit static. So I'm splattering a very light wash, a very light mix of the 110 Arthalo Blue, which is a cool blue, onto our blue paper just to kind of mix things up. So now I'm going to go in with a red. We have 121 here and I also have 113, our orange. I'm going to kind of mix the two and I'm using the red that we have to start developing some of the shadows on the pumpkin further. We want to push some of those segments further back into the illustration. And I'm using non-direct painting, non-direct application for this since I want to build up those colors. If we put the marker straight down onto it, it would not be as smooth a transition as we would get if we apply it to our craft mat first and then apply it to our paper. And you guys can see I'm working segment by segment to develop this color. So I started in my darkest segments first. That way I'm kind of establishing what I'm going for. And then I'm working lighter using less and less color covering smaller and smaller areas. And I'm curving my shadow because our pumpkin is a spherical surface. It's curved in many ways. And I want to indicate this form as much as possible. So I'm using the shadow to indicate the curve of the pumpkin. And I'm using a super soft squirrel brush for this painting, but you can really use whatever you're comfortable with using. You can use a synthetic brush for this. Um, I just happened to grab a really floppy squirrel brush. I wouldn't necessarily recommend painting with a really floppy squirrel brush for this.
And here's a better demonstration of the splatter technique. I'm applying these splatters to kind of loosen up, make the illustration a little bit more fun. Right now it's really constrained and really tight and really boring. And those splatters help loosen things up. So I allowed it to dry for an hour. You want to work with a dry surface once we start getting into our color pencils and allowing it to dry because like when you wet the tone paper, it does get darker, significantly darker, and that can affect how we judge color values. So I I allowed it to dry so I can see what I'm dealing with and now I'm going in with a much stronger mix of 121. So I also want to point out that my camera is having a bit of a hard time with the blue paper and the orange pumpkin. It kind of doesn't know what to do with this. So y'all are just going to have to trust me. And those of you who saw me at Hands On Creativity know this looks way better in person. So you're just going to have to trust me on this. I know that's, I know that's a challenge. So I'm going in and adding even more of our 110 to the underside of the pumpkin really kind of tightening up those cast shadows and then I'm going into the stem directly with 175 our sepia brown to really kind of start developing the shadows on the stem as well because if you guys have observed pumpkins if you're a Halloween aficionado you probably know that the stem has some of the same striations some of the same curved divoted forms that the pumpkin itself does I also went into the little cute curly cute stem with 264 and now that it's had a bit of a chance to dry, I'm going to go in with the amazing, super pigmented, really soft polychromos color pencils. Now, I know a lot of y'all think that Prismacolor is the Cadillac of color pencils. And I hate to tell y'all this, but y'all are wrong. So I do still use Prismacolor on occasion. And I like sketching with Prismacolor. But Prismacolor has switched hands several times. It's owned by Rubbermaid now. I got to be honest with you guys. They do not respond to their question inquiries because they also own Sharpie. And I have messaged them asking 
for information about Sharpies and they don't respond. And I've also messaged them asking for pigment information about Prismacolors and they don't respond. So to me, that tells me they do not care about the art supplies they're selling and they don't care about their customers. So just on that note alone, I'd rather use art supplies from a company that will answer my questions. So at this point, I want to start making that pumpkin pop make my peas pop y'all and I'm using our polychromos more peas here lots of alliteration today I'm using my polychromos to start building up our lighter colors so I'm starting with really light lemon yellows to start building up the light source on our pumpkin so when we're rendering this pumpkin we're thinking about light in a couple of different ways when we were working with the watercolor watercolor markers we were thinking more about developing our shadows now that we're working with these really opaque super pigmented color pencils we're thinking about building up our light so i was ragging on prismacolor now let me tell you guys why i like the polychromos so much better these things are super rich super soft super buttery really really good color lay down okay like if you want to lay down a lot of color if you want to blend your colors if you want just smooth easy to use color pencils these are way better than prismacolors and um they are very easy to sharpen i know some of y'all know this pain when you're sharpening your prismacolors and it snippety snaps snippety snaps snippety snaps like 18 dang times and you waste half your color pencil and I sketch with Prismacolors. I use terracotta to do a lot of my sketching. So this is a problem I know really well. That is not a problem with the polychromos. You sharpen it and it is sharp. You don't have to sharpen it six times because the, la the lead broke off in your pencil sharpener. So just from that alone, yeah, these pencils cost a lot more than Prismacolors do, but they're an investment. So now I'm kind of building up some of my shadows a little bit more using oranges and reds since I've kind of established our nice bright yellows, our nice bright light source. It's time for me to establish some of our shadows a little bit better too. You guys can really see how the combination of the watercolor markers and the color pencils allows us to build up and develop our color. So the Polychromos color pencils are not the watercolor pencils. That's the Albrecht Durer watercolor pencils, but they handle very similarly. The only difference really is that the Polychromos pencils, you can put water on top of them, you can paint on top of them, on top of them they're not going to go anywhere if you paint on top of the albert durer watercolor pencils they're going to move they're going to shift they're going to blend out so when you're selecting what kind of pencils you want to use for applying color like this that's something you might want to think about is do i need to blend out my color or am i applying color and it's going to stay where it's at and just like I mentioned earlier in the video, polychromos are part of the Faber-Castell color family. So you're going to be able to match your colors. And speaking of color family, I am using a pit pen to start inking the stem. And honestly, I'm probably using walnut for this if we're going to guess. And um, this is the brush pen. So it's got a flexible fiber brush nib on it. And as we discovered in my Faber-Castell unbox and swatch stream, which I'll link in the description below, you can actually remove the nib when it starts getting frayed and chewed up, flip it over, put it back in, and you've got a whole nother nib. So the Faber-Castell brush pin nibs, the pit pin nibs are actually double-sided and they're intended to be replaced like that. So you get twice the life out of your brush pin. And these are also India ink based. The difference between these and the Albrecht Durer watercolor markers is these are going to be waterproof when they're dry. And I'm using a really light orange, it's probably like orange glaze, to just start lining the outline of my pumpkin. Now I'm not doing it all all the way around I'm really just kind of doing it where there's shadow because I want to continue to develop this contrast now I'm using colored inks to line my pumpkin because if we used a black ink that would create what's kind of considered a dead line weight it's all one color and it can flatten your image if you use colored line arts if you use colored inks like we're using here and I'm using a medium red to ink the bottom, the sh shaded side of the pumpkin. If you use colored inks, you can get some contrast, you can get some delineation, but it's not so noticeable that this is an inked piece. Now, sometimes I want my pieces to look like ink pieces. Like when I'm doing the bonus chapter for Seven Inch Kara, Naomi's back to school special, it's inked and that's intentional. I'm giving it more of like a traditional comic look and I'm using the black ink to delineate forms. But for something like this, I want the inking to be subtle. I just want it to complement the piece and I don't want it to distract from the piece. 
So I think I mentioned this earlier, these brush pins also have color numbers on them and that's going to match with the Faber-Castell Albert Durer markers, the Faber-Castell Albert Durer watercolor pencils, and the polychromos pencils. So now I'm using a magenta color to continue to ink my pumpkin. I'm using this to really ink the shaded areas. Purples and red violets are very useful for inking orange and peach influenced things. It's darker, it's a little contrast. Actually, it's um, like a split contrast. A blue would be the immediate contrast, but it's like one off. And uh, greens would also be a split contrast for oranges, but it's a little bit warmer. It's not as distracting. It doesn't detract from the color as much, but it still implies shadow and shading. So if you're interested in doing more art, in working with color, understanding color theory, you don't have to be an expert. So many people are like, oh man, I really need to be better at color theory, but their color theory is fine. You just need a working understanding of what colors go with what colors and how to create shadow and what colors you would use to create shadows and when you should use contrasting colors for shadow or if that's gonna deaden the whole piece. Just a working understanding and loads of experimentation will be enough. So I'm using one of the, the Pit Pin opaque white uh, pit pen. So this one has a bullet nib instead of the brush pen, but otherwise it's the same as the pit pen big brush. And these are cool too, because you can directly apply them to your illustration as you see here, and you get a lot of white there, or you can apply it to a non porous surface, pick it up with a wet brush and then apply it. And that allows for more controlled blending. So you can see that I'm doing that right there. Something I would love, 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 love to see Pitt release or Faber-Castell release is one, um, an Albrecht Durer white watercolor marker would be super duper helpful. And two, a smaller Pitt brush pin. So like the small regular size Pitt pins with the brush tip in white. Now white pigments are larger particle sizes than other types of pigments. You'll learn about this if you fall into like the fountain pen trap and you decide you want to try to buy a white ink and then you find out why they can't do white inks for fountain pens. The particles are just too big. They're going to clog the fountain pens. So this is a problem also for like foam rubber nibbed uh, inking pens and fiber nibbed inking pens. So individual bristle inking pens, brush pens, etc. So like Posca, it's not really an issue. But for smaller, finer tips, it can clog. But I would love to see Faber-Castell combat this problem and release some because honestly, I feel like I can never get enough good white inking things. And you guys saw that because I did a big field test with bunches of white correctional inks. Now, y'all, I gotta be real. I didn't use like every white ink I own, right? That's not the point. My point is to find the best ones for correcting inks. And I tested them over several different types of inks. I tested them with watercolor on top and I tested them with alcohol marker on top because my goal is to help you guys find the best supplies to solve your problems. So now I'm going back in with the polychromos color pencils and I'm just kind of working back and forth. We're using a little bit of black just to kind of accent the shading on the stems. Now normally I avoid black. I feel like in general it kind of deadens what I'm doing and now I'm using helio blue to just kind of further work the, sh the shaded blue in the background and a little bit of white just to really pull the highlights and make it pop from the paper a little bit more. So we are just about finished. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me. Hopefully this was helpful, useful, and inspiring for you guys. Hopefully I was able to demonstrate and explain several really cool products that can help you take your color illustration maybe to the next level. Getting mixed media is really fun and it's a great way to select the best traits from each product so that you can make the most of your illustration. Staying true, quote unquote, true to just one product doesn't necessarily make the best end illustration. So I'm a big fan of getting mixed media and getting what you need from individual products. Speaking of getting what you need, y'all, I do so many 
reviews and tutorials here on this channel. So it would really mean a lot to me if you took a moment, you hit subscribe and you also hit the bell notification. I'm trying to grow this channel, trying to help more people. So if you like what I do, please tell people you like it. Share this channel. Don't keep it a secret. Don't be that artist who keeps good things to themselves and never helps their friends. And if you decide to share it on social media, tag me at Natto Soup. It means the world to me when you guys share my stuff. So thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys again.